welcome to Lukas Varkowski and also Paul Kroenjäger. He's a colleague of us to our second webinar on the question how you can leverage the power of mobile for sustainable and measurable impacts in your agriculture projects. Start with a few points about Yamo. We are a mobile uh, development consultancy. Um, we are, let's say, strategy advisors, a, a social, global social business based out of Canada, out of Toronto. Uh, but with local teams and offices in now already 25 countries uh, all across uh, Africa and the Caribbean and Asia. And our work is uh, predominantly uh, helping our clients and our partners to uh, leverage mobile, uh, simple mobile phones and, and even smartphones that people have in their pockets or that your field agents might have to have a bigger, faster and more efficient impact. In the last year alone, we have worked uh, with about 120 organizations uh, around the globe, from small to big. This is just a few examples, including UCAID, BIFID, uh, UNICEF, uh, the World Bank, uh, private sector organizations, and the banking sphere, but also agribusinesses, uh, bigger NGOs like CRS, and um, most recently also GIZ. Um, and Paul is one of the pioneers working with us uh, in GIZ, so I'm extremely happy to be joined by him today. Um, and we reach about 150,000 people on their simple mobile phones every day. We are a social business, which means we are, uh, we're not uh, making profit for anyone's new car, but any profit that we do make is uh, essentially reinvested. Uh, so we have a social mission and we are extremely sustainable. We are working always with the mobile network operators, with the telecommunication companies, where their partners, not their competitors. Our system works directly uh, with their systems. It's not going via internet. And we're, of course, fully compliant with any uh, data protection requirements. So when we talk about mobile for development, we need to take the perspective from the user group which is essentially uh, focusing on people like Georgette. The, the woman in, in the picture is Georgette from rural Madagascar, where I am based. And uh, she's probably working in rice or, uh, or another production. And when we think about her daily life uh, as a producer, as a farmer, as a micro farmer, smallholder farmer, she needs to take decisions, several decisions every day. Is she going to plant? Is she going to harvest? Is she going to uh, maybe work a field, uh, is it gonna, going to rain, um, when is she going to sell her product, and so on. The problem is, with the low capacities of the extension services all around African countries, it's highly unlikely that she has an extension worker around the corner that she can go to and ask the questions. But she has a lot of questions every day. And sometimes the answers are quite simple. And the knowledge is available somewhere in some fish technique and some technical documents, um, but not accessible to her. Not accessible when she needs it. She might be, she might have the opportunity to listen to a few rural radio shows, maybe in the evening and so on. But if she has a question in the morning on the Monday, she might need to wait until Wednesday evening for the, for the radio show. And that might hamper her production, and that prevents her from taking good decisions. Now, if you think about that, uh, when you have a question, when you, when you need to take a decision, uh, or when I do, we just have our internet or on our smartphone, we just open Google and we go on. But that is not corresponding with the reality of Georgette and, and the like. Um, most of them, or many of them, do not have smartphones, if not most of them. And if they do, then it's still prohibitively expensive. Our approach at Biamo is really making knowledge accessible for people on the ground uh, by using the applications and by using the simple mobile phones they have in their pockets and through other services. So I, I brought you a little example just from, <clears throat> from Tunisia. Our approach is basically focused on human-centered design, and for that we need to really take into consideration the local context. In Tunisia, we, we see that more than three out of four households have a, have a mobile phone, access to a mobile phone throughout the country, uh, probably more in urban areas, but uh, probably close to three out of four or 75 percent in rural areas. However, about a quarter of the rural population here is illiterate, and uh, that is probably even higher in many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, certainly higher in Madagascar and most likely higher in your countries. Um, as well. 
And then again, if we look at mobile, um, many of us think of mobile for development in terms of apps and Androids and smartphones and so on. But here in, in Tunisia, just 20% of the um, territory is covered with 3G or 4G networks. So that means just one out of five Tunisians have theoretically access to mobile internet. So that means four out of five don't have access to mobile internet. And most likely, it's most likely that the majority of people that do not have access to mobile internet live in rural areas. So that means that to give access to information, mobile internet, applications, apps, smartphones, and so on is out of question. But given the illiteracy, SMS and anything related to SMS is also out of question because you're, you're basically preventing a big part of your target group from actually accessing the information. So this is clearly just a Tunisia example. You, you know the data better for your countries, but I'd be surprised if that would be significantly better than here. It's certainly not for Madagascar. So what we need to do is to use an old technology, simple mobile phones in a new way. And we want to do that um, at Viamo to connect individuals and organizations to make a better decision. So we take the simple mobile phones that people have in their pockets that your target group your beneficiaries have in their pockets to give them access to knowledge and uh, to facilitate behavior change communication, actual uh, behavior change. And on the same time, uh, use those devices to help you to collect the feedback, to collect data in real time, to have the impact and the insights. And uh, we do that uh, with about 150,000 people all around the world each day that we reach on their simple devices that they have in their pockets. Now, the way we do that is with interactive voice response. You can think of that as automated vocal communication. So uh, it's basically um, a process where your technical content is optimized for mobile communication. We have, again, about 10 years experience in that. And uh, we know what works well. We know what makes a good, lang a good message. We know how to keep it simple. Um, it always needs to include a definition, um, a relevancy for your beneficiaries, and uh, a call to action. I had a very interesting discussion a few weeks back with someone in the Ministry of Agriculture in Madagascar, and they said, no, we can't explain production that easy. It's way more complicated uh, for rice, and we can't keep it that simple. That might be true, but if you want to have your beneficiaries accessing your information, accessing the information they need, you have to think it out of their perspective and not out of a perspective of a government official. It's not about, uh, in, in French, uh, diffusion. It's not about just blasting out the information, but it's about relevancy and about giving your beneficiaries access to the information, making it as relevant as possible to them. Now, we then translated it, uh, those messages in any uh, language you might need in your local context. Uh, we can run the system um, in a lot of different languages at the same time with an unlimited call volume. We record then those messages, we pre-test them with the target group, and then basically uh, start the mass communication, uh, set up a hotline or uh, send out a call with your questionnaire and uh, take the access data that is coming in in real time to basically test how this is perceived by your uh, beneficiaries and improve it um, dynamically and constantly. And you have access to that uh, in dashboards in real time um, to the data. So if you think of that, let's say you set up an e-extension hotline, it's an example in a few slides, and then your beneficiaries can call in. The first thing that they hear is for French, press 1, for Malagashi, press 2, for um, whatever, press 3. And then a welcome message where, where they hear how the system works, where they're going to hear a number of choices, uh, listen carefully, take the phone away from your ear, and make the choice on your phone keypad, simple keypad. And, and we know that um, even people in rural areas, even if they can't read and write, they handle money every day, so they know the numbers, that it's working fairly well. And then the options are like press 1 for tomato, press 2 for pineapple, uh, or one for production, two for harvesting, three for pest prevention, and so on. Uh, it's extremely, it's extremely open and extremely flexible uh, indeed. Now, what are the advantages? In fact, for your beneficiaries, they have access to knowledge in the moment of need. Uh, they are not obliged to wait for the next field visit, to wait for the next radio show, uh, or the next training that you might facilitate. 
They continue their learning path and they're equipped with anything they need for better decision making, um, which then ultimately leads to a higher productivity and profits, which is probably your indicator, and a higher quality in their products, uh, and of course, the personalization, and they are interacting and participating in the process. A uh, phenomenon that, that I've seen uh, in a few countries is that a lot of uh, local or smallholder farmers feel a bit detached from uh, ministries and from even donor-run uh, organizations. They feel just being, let's say, the recipients of training or the recipients of ingredients or the recipients of financing. But they do not have really have the impression that they can make a choice themselves. Now, with a system where they can choose whatever information they're accessing whenever they want, you give them the not only the impression that they're interacting and participating, they actually do. Because anytime they interact, anytime they make a choice, uh, they generate a data set on the back end, which you can use in real time for better decision making. Now, if we move to the right of the slide, you see the advantages for you as the donor or uh, your partners, the local ministries or local agribusinesses or local NGOs. You, essentially, through such a system, you win a lot of efficiency. Efficiency in extension service delivery, efficiency in program planning, efficiency in monitoring evaluation. You do that because you win real-time data, as, we, as, as I just explained. Anytime one of your beneficiaries or one of your field agents calls into the hotline to access information, or anytime you shoot out a, a survey, uh, you have any data in real time. There's no need to wait until you new until your enumerators are back from the field to actually um, then analyze the data. You have dashboards in real time uh, with your indicators along your needs. And you can use those dashboards for better decision making. You can send out alerts if an indicator reaches a certain level. And um, you can essentially then through that decision making based on data rather than hypothesis, based on evidence rather than theory, address the needs of your beneficiaries way better than, uh, than many of us actually do at the moment. And in that way, increase your service quality, the, the quality of the services that you provide your beneficiaries with, and actually increase your efficiency. Uh, and that is a full cycle. And uh, the last webinar, we heard a lot about the potential of big data in agriculture, but the question is where this data actually coming from? And uh, here's, one of the, here's one of the solutions. It's pretty simple to set up. And uh, we're reaching, as I said, 150,000 people already each day um, so that is more than 150,000 data sets that are coming in each day that our partners can already use uh, for better decision making. Now, <clears throat> I talked a lot about automated vocal communication, but you can, of course, integrate and come up with an integrative communication strategy. Um, what we provide is a flexible platform. Our software that we've developed that is uh, working and, and, and running on, on the uh, mobile network operator server is basically integrating all communication channels. So you can integrate to the left the big phone with the heart because we love it a lot, the vocal automated communication, but you can also integrate SMS campaigns, for example, send out automatic SMS alerts or send out SMS updates to your field staff or uh, SMS reminders to anyone. You can integrate mobile uh, or mobile application um, and basically, for example, collect field data, collect phone numbers of your beneficiaries, and then in real time send out a knowledge retention survey, uh, a voice-based knowledge retention survey that is highly inclusive and is not leaving out women or youth in rural areas to check two weeks after your training if they have actually applied what, you, what, you, uh, what they learned in your training. And uh, we're working on the integration of web forms into the platform. And all, all that, so that, that you have all data in the same platform, in the same database, uh, right in the middle, which you can then access through your dashboard and basically access any data that is coming in there through any communication channel to make better decisions. So uh, that is essentially the idea. And um, that is, of course, a lot of uh, theory at the moment. That is why we uh, developed, let's say, three examples of things that we're actually doing right now to give you a better idea and a better understanding how that might uh, might look in, in the practice and to check if that is interesting for you or not. I then hand it over to Paul 
um, to show us what he's doing with one of our uh, systems in Malawi. My name is Paul Koniger. I've been here in the More Income and Employment Project in rural areas in Malawi for the last two years. I will be focusing on, on one of the options that um, Viamo is offering, um, namely the, the smartphone application. First of all, let me give you a little bit of a background to our uh, program here in Malawi. It's called More Income and Employment in Rural Areas. So we are sort of a hybrid private sector development and rural development. And we, we're departing from um, market opportunities um, that have been identified in the value chains that we're working in, mostly agricultural value chains, uh, cassava, groundnuts, soya, and sunflower, and also tourism and uh, eco-friendly construction materials. And we focus on the downstream part of the value chain that is um, from processing to marketing. Mira has uh, three components, one focusing on, uh, we call it inclusive business models, for instance, uh, lead companies that want to do implement contract farming schemes uh, or outgrower schemes. Um, the second one is uh, focusing on service provision, marketing services such as, as I mentioned, market information, storage, um, or warehouse receipt systems. And the third component is more di directly involved with uh, our target groups, that is farmer organizations, um, smallholder farmer individuals also, and the micro, small, and medium enterprises. Uh, to give you a better idea, and we have this little diagram here where we show how we're linking um, our, our main partners, which are mostly lead companies, agro-industrial companies on the right side, um, to our target groups, which are the farmer organizations and the MSMEs. And then uh, in the middle, we also have the service providers, which, which we use, for instance, the commodity exchange um, as a marketing channel. So there are different... Uh, schemes to in which we try to integrate uh, smallholders more into into value addition, be it through better marketing, uh, increasing the productivity, uh, processing, um, and um, our main partners are so to speak those those companies and service providers. Now our program and our partners um, we have similar needs and interests when it comes uh, to to some ICT for agricultural solutions. First of all, we need to coordinate field operations. Most of, most of our partners have their own extension staff or field staff uh, to, to organize the outdoor stream service delivery or the trainings. We want to be uh, um, good in targeting beneficiaries, find the right FOs, also um, getting to know them, FOs farm, being farmer organizations, and um, building some trust. And of course, we need to be really good in monitoring. So we need to check attendance at uh, events, do surveys, get feedback on, on the trainings that we offer, such, uh, such as farmer business schools, for instance. Um, so this is one need where, where we go more into, let's say, data collection and analysis. Um, but we're also interested in using ICT for Act to to implement you know, human capacity development, for instance, follow-ups on the farmer business schools. How can we <coughs> make sure that, that the knowledge sticks, uh, for instance, after a, a very intensive training, it could be cropping calendars or market information, weather data, economic practices, and so on. So we have those two, let's say, areas of work where we would like to engage in, but the first one, since, well, since we've been in operation, has been the more the one we've been focusing on more, let's say, the data collection and analysis. Um, because first of all, we needed to find um, target groups before before even thinking about now what to, what to implement with them, really. So then we chose the Data Winners app, which is one of the features that Viamo is offering. It's an app that you can use on a smartphone or also on the on the internet. There's also a web application, and it's basically made to to do complex surveys. So you can do all sorts of multiple choice questions, what if questions, and so on. On you see on the right bottom a little screenshot, for instance, where we ask uh, what sort of training have you received in the last two years, and could be, for instance, a good agricultural practices training or governance and so on. So our starting point was that we were working with a lead company who wanted to better coordinate their contract farming scheme and the targeting of their um, FOs, and we know that um, there's this uh, open source software, open data kit, and a lot of um, applications uh, use that. 
Uh, we explored options and there are quite a number of options here in Malawi from uh, farm forest, Isoko is quite well known in, in East Africa, smallholder, um, and then data winners. So, anyway, our starting point was contract farming management and here in Malawi there are different providers for ODK solutions being uh, one is farm forest, Isoko, one is called smallholder, and then data winners we found. And we picked data winners. Um, Mostly because there is a very good um, local support team here and they offer training. It's a uh, quite nice package and we think that training uh, our enumerators, our field staff is really quite important. And also training the project managers to develop complex questionnaires. So that was really a big plus to, to, to data winners because they have um, a, present in, a presence in all the countries that they operate in, Viamo. Um, so Lucas, for instance, he is the project manager for Madagascar and here we have Amy and uh, other colleagues also, and also there is a very nice uh, tech support on Skype. So I'm, I'm a little bit advertising it, um, but I'm not being paid for it. Yeah? So, but we've had really good um, experiences in, in the whole support area. Um, maybe other options have more features, I'm not, I'm not so sure, but this has been working well for us for data collection. Now, after choosing data winners, what we did what was really important is really um, not only train our field staff on on how to use the app, but really also to how to conduct those interviews, so how to ask questions in a non-leading way and so on. So we did a lot of capacity development with partner staff on how to basically do focus group discussions uh, with this app. Lucas, maybe can you take over? Uh, sure. They're essentially using our data winners application, uh, the, the web uh, basically mobile data collection, um, and then connected with a database in the back end to uh, survey uh, about 150 different farm organizations and basically uh, check what they are doing and to, to assess their governance and some business potential for better targeting of the farmers for baseline and, and monitoring, uh, of course, to build the data, actually build a database of beneficiaries. So there's uh, no database uh, existing so mm -hmm. far. Paul, are you back? Are you back? Yeah, I'm back. I don't know. Can you can you hear me? Yes, yeah. I can hear you. Great. Okay, okay. I'll leave it to very, you. Very sorry. Um, the internet here has its hiccups. Yeah, but I, I see you already did some of my presentation. So FO assessments have been the the main point of what we've been doing. We've also um, hired some enumerators who went around interviewing more than 350 agro dealers. These are little shops that sell inputs um, because you also want to, to build their capacity to better link to farmers and so on. That's also another component that we're doing. Now we're using um, data winners to do quality checks on the farmer business schools. So our partner field staff accompanies our FBS trainers and does um, independent sort of quality checks, evaluations of the training quality. And then also our partners, they all have a project manager account. So they can use their own questionnaires um, to work with, the, with their clients or beneficiaries. And they have started, for instance, doing client surveys to find out whether the services are appropriate, they are working, what to, what to change, uh, how people are using them, and so on. So these are some, some examples of how Mira and its partners have been using data win winners. So we've really focused on this data collection and analysis part. Now the whole analysis still needs to happen mostly on, on our end in Excel or in GIS or however you want to use it, but as a data collection tool it's been very helpful and partners really uh, have appreciated having this tool and really start using it. So I think that's already quite a, um, quite a success. And just to finish up, as I said, we've been using the Data and Winners app, but the other options um, that are there that Viamo and others are offering are also interested, uh, interesting. For instance, our one partner, the Agricultural Commodity Exchange, is already, already using the Viamo 3 to 1 service for market information. This is, one, this is IVR. And uh, other partners are also interested to, to use IVR or SMS to push out, um, let's say, knowledge on, on, on good agricultural practices, um, to get in touch yeah, with their clients, support them in the field and so on. Also mobile money of course is quite interesting for contract farming but also for when using the commodity exchange because um, timely payments are a big issue here in Malawi. And then I already come to the challenges in, in implementing all that is that the mobile penetration here is really very low 
uh, not only in terms of access to having a phone at all, but really airtime is, is a big issue. It's one of the most uh, expensive countries in the world, I think, when it comes to to uh, buying data or even just uh, making phone calls. And then mobile money, unlike other places like Kenya, is really um, not yet very developed. Only 7.7% .7 of people have been using this, and I'm sure that most most of them are, are people from the urban areas. And then, of course, literacy levels and especially digital literacy levels are rather low. So we want to go more into new solutions, IVR, edutainment. There are really cool things, and uh, we want to go there more. But um, as a starter, data winners has already been very helpful. Yeah. Um, and Thank that's you. it for my part. <laughs> Thank you very much, Paul. Um, there's a couple of questions that go to you, so I just um, tell you now, we can also find them actually in the chat, they are from Anna, and she asked two different questions. First was, um, how, how is the database that you would talk, talked about built? So I think this is also maybe a question like the database, maybe this is also something Lucas can answer. And then there was a second question of Anna, and she also asked, can you say a bit more about the contract farming aspect that you talked about? So maybe first, yeah, Lucas Paul, who's going to answer the database question? Well, I can answer the technical part, and then yes. Paul can say what's actually in there. Yeah, um, right. So theoretically, and um, well, uh, with with data winners or any any of our services, as as I showed in the first slides. You win a lot of data in real time. Uh, with data winners, maybe sometimes it's stocked first on the mobile phone, um, on the smartphone, or on the tablet, and then updated once the tablet is connected to Wi-Fi or back in a, in a mobile internet environment. And then the data is synchronized with the server and is basically nourishing a database. That depends very much on, on the client. We can set up the database in the cloud, which is the, an easier uh, solution. And that database is basically, um, you can think of that a bit like an extremely protected Excel, um, extremely protected Excel file. Uh, it, it isn't an Excel file, so no worries. And it's not an access database something. It's a very professional solution, but uh, the data is going in, in there in real time. And then you have basically all the information of any, any farmer surveyed or any farmer that has access to surveys. And uh, the other solution would be to have the database on your local machine, on your local computer, or if you do happen to have a server or your partner ministry has a server or your agribusiness, we can also we could also install it at that server, provided that the server has a constant internet access. That very very much depends on on your um, on your context. So Paul, I, how you do how you, how do you do it? Um, yeah, this is actually a big question for us so far. We've been collecting a lot of data, and we haven't really uh, found a great way yet um, to building a database. Um, at the moment, it is um, Excel, and I think our partners have their own databases. Um, and actually, something to look into more, how to, how to also track perhaps um, beneficiaries who have been involved in more than one uh, intervention. Let's say they have received inputs on loan from the contract farming scheme, and on the other hand, they have been trained in pharma business school. So for m and &E, that's quite interesting to look at the different combinations of uh, support uh, and so on, and then you could you could analyze that. But at the moment, uh, this is something we're also <laughs> still designing, and um, yeah, we haven't really found a great solution yet beyond Excel, but uh, I hear from Biamo that they're also working on something. I don't know if you already mentioned, Lucas. Yeah, yeah exactly. We're, we're working on that. We're basically developing uh, a system where you could not only then store the data in the database on the server, where, where you could also then use your, uh, in the beginning, certainly your tablet or your smartphone, but maybe down the road as a simple mobile phone to actually actually access the database from the field again. So to say, let's say Paul is a farmer somewhere in rural Malawi, and I'd be the field agent, and I walk up to him and say, so give me your farm identification number or something. And then yeah. I, could, I could type it in and then pull up the record and say, ah, cool, great. So you took part in the training last year. So what happened since then? Um, which would facilitate a lot of things. But as, as Paul said, that's in the making. Uh, it's, we're working on that. Um, because it's, it's a great need uh, for contract farming. 
Yeah, that is exactly that's the need we have. We need to identify, especially in the business uh, sector, identify clients and, for instance, build a credit history that you can pull out in real time to say, okay, this guy, uh, he gets an input loan because he's always paid back in time, let's say, or so that um, or to to already uh, store other data such as how much commodity have they grown and are willing to to market now. And I don't know that you can you can do a lot of things with a database. Um, yeah, I'm really looking forward to that solution. At the moment, the question on the other question on contract farming for us, it was really to to just build a, build a let's say portfolio of um, pharma groups and assess their potential in terms of production and uh, governance and business uh, capacity. Because you really wanna in a country like Malawi, you need to work with farmers that have a sort of mindset of, of agribusiness already and you can't build it up from, from the very bottom as a private sector company. So this was mostly um, the reason for doing the contract farming, but also it's it's a nice tool to coordinate your field staff, um, what they do for reporting. I've met Pharma Organization X and Y and um, this is basic data for, for my meeting and so on. So there are different uh, ways to use that. Thanks. Um, there's a couple of more questions. Um, though the first one was now, again, I'm coming to back then, that is from Sophia. She asked, who has access to the collected data? I think we discussed that several times, so probably, Lucas, you can say something about who actually has access to the collected data. Thanks. Um, so there's, there's two sides to data protection, right? One side is have a safe data transmission channel. Um, and that is actually, uh, in, in many cases, the mobile phone operators that are basically taking care of that to make sure that the data is not being tweaked on the way. Um, and that's their, um, that's their expertise. The second, um, the, the second thing is basically to, uh, to make sure that uh, when the data is in the database that it's not being uh, mistreated or misused. And our databases can be hosted no matter where, as I said, we can, and I know for GIA that's quite important to have it in the European Union, that is certainly uh, no issue. We do that already with a number of clients. And then uh, set up uh, basically um, the password protected uh, accesses to the database. So uh, you can decide who has uh, what kind of access type to the database. You can think of that as like, different account, account types on your computer. Um, you can probably not change any settings on your GIZ computers because you're not the administrator. Um, and the same thing could happen to the database so that people can just, a few people can just see the data, a few people could download it, a few people could maybe do analysis, and uh, maybe a few people with a data protection uh, uh, approval uh, might actually have the opportunity to, uh, to change the data if that might be needed. Okay, um, thanks, Lucas. Exactly. Cool. And there was one previous question also from Anna, and she also want to know um, uh, how is the outreach um, to the formats with your technologies and also the costs? Either you answer that question now or you just finish your presentation and afterwards. What do you prefer? I prefer finishing, to be honest. Okay, And then, good, uh, and we'll, then... we'll come back to that, Anna. That is promised. Okay, good. Thanks, you. Okay, well, many thanks to Paul. Thanks a lot for, for presenting your example in Malawi. Um, we stay in your neighborhood, Paul, and we're going to have a look at the 3 to 1 or um, our AG, IVR powered AG service in Malawi, uh, which I would like to show you. That's basically, it's, it's based on voice based communication. So it's a hotline where people can call in uh, at any time. It's available 24 7 and available in several local languages. And they can uh, call in and actually um, choose their uh, gender and choose their localization, choose their age. And then um, we could set it up in a way that uh, any, any women then just hear a female voice, any man just hear a male voice. It depends on, on local context. Um, but it's, it's free for the callers. It's actually paid uh, in a partnership with the mobile network operator in Malawi, with Airtel. And uh, we have about uh, 75,000 unique users calling in every month. Uh, uh, many of them are repeat users, but we're just counting unique users. And they have access to personalized and georeference uh, extension information, so ACK advice, for example, press 1 for 
I don't know, uh, mice, uh, press 2 for, for whatever, and then have a lot of uh, access to a lot of pre-registered messages on planting, on harvesting, on post-protection, on diseases, and so on. Now, the great thing is that the system itself, all the data that is coming in, is being treated in a machine learning environment. So uh, our system is basically uh, an intelligent enough to figure out who might be interested in what. Uh, so if you're calling in, um, if you've called in last month and you're calling back this month, the chances are high that you're still planting and still in the same value chain. So the system is then recognizing it and is giving you targeted advice. Um, and that is even can be coupled with weather news. We already have weather updates in the system in, in Malawi, so access to to weather information, uh, lo uh, localized weather information that is updated twice a day, and people can call in and access that information whenever they need it. So there's no need of pushing that out and sending out millions of SMS or sending out radio shows or whatever. Any farmer can just call in in their local language, um, which is highly inclusive, even, even for women and, uh, and men in the rural areas that can't read and write. They can still have access to it and get the information. We are at the moment working at a system where that weather updates are basically coupled with uh, ARC advice. So that, uh, let's say for mice, um, I'm, I'm not an agronomist, I'm just making this up, but let's say it would be the, the planting time, and it's important that it's uh, not going to rain in the next three days, then in the back end, uh, our uh, machine learning environment could figure out that it's not going to rain in your region, Malawi, in the next three days. And if you happen to listen to the ACK advice and you listen to uh, well, ACK advice on mice and you listen to weather update um, right after that, then you might hear, okay, tomorrow it's going to be dry and uh, light clouds and light wind. By the way, uh, you're planting mice. Uh, it's a good time to plant now. It's not going to rain in the next three days. So the that's uh, that's in the making at the moment. <clears throat> um, as Paul said, um, all callers have access to market prices that are provided through uh, a local partner that's basically collecting them with the Ministry for Agriculture in Malawi. Um, and people can also deposit their offers and their, um, their demands for products. So it's developing into a marketplace slowly. And uh, that includes an integration of mobile money. Uh, it's working with about 14 value chains at the moment. It's being set up with uh, um, agribusinesses, the private sectors in there, including the mobile network operator. Uh, that's a huge potential for a, a public-private partnership. But again, 75,000 unique users per month, and that's growing. Um, it's it's for free to them, mostly for free. Um, and we're extremely proud uh, to uh, about the fact that we had a an external evaluation of scientific research this year that uh, figured out that seventy percent of uh, all our users that are calling into the service have actually adopted best practices with a significant statistically significant effect on their profit and on their margin. Um, and uh, we believe that this is a great. Example, we have those services and they're like services in about 12 and uh, rising um, countries uh, where we operate. We have that in Madagascar, for example, with a whole lot of other information, um, including on health and including on uh, women empowerment, including on financial inclusion and so on. So our services are not only for the ag sector, but uh, this is just an, an agricultural uh, example. Okay, um, the last example that I've brought uh, for today is for mobile data collection. Now, we've spoken about uh, the, the great experience that Paul has made in Malawi with mobile data collection on tablets, um, which is uh, necessary in, in many cases. But let's say you, you've run a baseline study. Um, as we've done, for example, as I've done in a previous role with the Green Innovation Centers, and you uh, you might be able to collect the phone numbers of your beneficiaries or your training participants. You take the phone numbers, you take the written consent, um, either the signature or your the fingerprint. They are okay to be contacted again, and you can shoot out automated uh, IVR, so voice-powered surveys, um, immediately, whenever you want. Um, it's basically an idea that you can target your training participants or your beneficiaries X time after your intervention to check if they have adopted um, the training content 
if their uh, income has increased and so on. The great advantage of that is you don't have to actually send enumerators in the field. You can just uh, basically uh, automize it and program the survey and shoot it out, and you can target a tenth of thousands of households in one day. Uh, we've actually done that once with about 80,000 households in one afternoon, and we had all the data in the evening. Now, it's significantly cheaper than traditional surveys with enumerators and tablets. That's the World Bank uh, that came up with that figure. That's 95% cheaper to, for them, uh, mainly because of the fact it's faster and you don't have to send around people in the field. You don't have to pay per DMs. You, have, you don't have to send around cars and so on. You don't have to need to need people that basically then maybe type your, in worst cases, your data on paper back into a system and so on. Um, and the response rates of those surveys, um, you, you might wonder, and let's say if you receive a call and are people actually open to answer that call and answer to this question, they actually are. But that depends on, on how you do it. And we have, uh, as I said, more than 10 years experience in that. So we, we've done a lot of mistakes. And that's, that's a whole other story, of course. But we've learned, we've gone a long way, and we've learned a lot about that. And now we know what to do to keep the response rates up. And uh, we, reach, we usually reach response rates between 80 and 95%. That is basically uh, um, thanks to a few things. One is... Um, that we know, based on the access data, the best time to reach your beneficiaries. So let's say we've already run a few surveys in Ghana, uh, so we know, okay, women in rural areas between 35 and 50 years are, are most likely to respond to a survey on a Sunday afternoon. So we try the Sunday afternoon. Um, if they do not pick up this, our system can call them back again, maybe an hour or two hours later. Uh, and the first thing that they hear is a welcome message, uh, Hello, this is a GI that ran survey. Uh, we, we need to do that, or we want to do that to improve our extension service delivery. Uh, kindly respond to the following 20 questions. Um, your information will be treated uh, confidentially. Now, it's, it's quite important to, uh, to explain to the target group um, why you do it. It's the same with household surveys. But after that welcome message, people can actually tap one for OK, continue, and two for no, I'm not interested. And if they tap one, uh, but hang up later, maybe because they've run out of time or run out of battery and so on, the system is uh, automatically calling them back a few hours later, maybe a day later, um, to continue the survey. And let's say if they finish question three and then stopped and the system calls them back, they hear the welcome and, or a, a different welcome message again and then continue with question four. So that way we can make sure that they actually uh, have or complete the surveys unless they actively say they don't want to complete. Uh, you might you might be wondering about the accuracy of that, about the accuracy of the data that people get through mobile phones. Um, and our partner WFP in Uganda, the World Food Program, they were a bit skeptical. So we, we we've done an, a very interesting uh, trial and error thing where we ran the same survey um, on mobile to mobile via IBR and then. WFP sent a traditional household survey at the same time. Um, and the results are about 99% the same, uh, but the exception is that we were more or at least five times faster than WFP in their uh, traditional household survey on the ground. So um, basically the bottom line here is with mobile to mobile surveys, you have full data in just a few hours. And in an ideal case, and it's significantly cheaper, but significantly faster than any field-level data collection. And there are a few limits, and I want to be very open to that. Uh, the maximum of questions for mobile-to-mobile -mobile survey is about 25 questions. After that, the user experience is really bad, and respondents are not interested in it anymore. Um, plus, you cannot collect any data, any, let's say, any pictures, uh, and so on. You can uh, run open questions where people give the response Let's say, okay, uh, please, please speak uh, 30 seconds after the beep. That works very well. But uh, that's, that's, the, that's the limit, basically. Um, so uh, qualitative and quantitative questions is, is okay, but the limit is 25 questions per survey and uh, no visual information because it's on the phone, on the simple mobile phone. Okay, 
so that's that's about the examples. We've now seen something something interesting here. I mean, if we talk about mobile communication, <clears throat> we have a few different opportunities and a few different strategies um, and, and ways to engage that. Paul uh, and the team in Malawi set up a data awareness or mobile app um, to collect complex data in the field, which you couldn't do with IVR. Um, if set up a few IVR systems around the world and reach about 150,000 people on them for, for different reasons, mostly to give them access for information. And we have a lot of systems that are then coupled with automated SMS alerts, SMS reminders, and so on. So what I want to encourage you is basically to think about mobile for development as a strategic approach and not only as a tool. If you think of it as a tool, you lose a lot of potential. But take it into consideration to your strategy. And that is what we that is what we do a lot with our partners to consult them on the strategy. There are many things that you don't know that you don't know probably. Um, as I do not know what I don't know about agriculture. And it's quite important then to take that into consideration. So what's what's the best way to set up a mobile strategy? Where, the key factors here is basically the context of your beneficiaries and your program objectives. So do you need to include uh, people that can't read and write? If you do, then IVR, so voice-based communication, is the way to go. SMS don't work in a rural setting if you have illiterates. And uh, mobile apps, probably neither. If the condition is, as in most sub-Saharan African countries, and we just heard it from Paul, again, it's, it's not even evident that you have mobile coverage everywhere in the country, despite even mobile internet. The condition is is a bit uh, weak in there. Then it's it's a big plus for uh, voice based communication and SMS. If you want to give your beneficiaries access to information whenever they need it in a pull channel where they can pull the information when they need it, rather than you pushing it into the field, then it's definitely a goal for voice based communication for IVR. And you might set that up with uh, mobile applications. We're working a lot with chatbots and Facebook and WhatsApp for more advanced markets, uh, particularly in India and Indonesia, but that is potentially coming to Africa, but certainly not anytime soon, and not anytime in your program runtime. Um, and SMS is not very uh, um, set up to be a pull channel. It can be tweaked, and we do that sometimes, but again, you need to take into consideration most of your beneficiaries can't read and write at the bottom. Of the pyramid. No Thanks, Lucas. Just um, sure. we are running a bit out of time, but I still would like you can maybe at this um, particular file now say a few words to the costs and the outreach of the different technologies that would fit here very well. Sure. Um, okay. Now for for the cost, it's it's um, it's a quite difficult to say because it's very flexible. So that means that the costs are quite flexible. But we have. Uh, three different kinds of cost. One, one cost is to set up a system. The second, uh, so that's an initial cost for the translation of the messages to work with you on the content and so on. That depends on how many messages you want to set up for IVR and SMS. For uh, data winners, that is a bundle. It's basically a subscription that in already includes the training that Paul has mentioned, and that is uh, coming at about uh, 5,000 uh, US dollars for one year, and that already includes um, a bunch of, of SMS so that you can send data from your smartphone via SMS to the server so that you don't rely, need to rely on mobile internet except for images. For, uh, for IVR and, and SMS uh, systems, you then have an additional cost, which is our platform license. Uh, that uh, lands you at, at about uh, 2,500 US dollars each month. And the third cost is communication cost. And communication cost depends very much on how many people you want to reach, how many people do you call per month, or how many people will call in, um, how long will each call be. That depends on how many messages you're going to set up. And then, uh, of course, on the communication cost in the country, which varies from country to country. We heard about Malawi, which is very expensive. Tunisia, for example, is very cheap. Um, it, but you can usually say that we are way below, thanks to our framework contracts, way below uh, the communication cost that you would pay on by just buying airtime on the street. 
there's actually um, um, a bit the, the rough answer to it. I'd be very happy to explain, uh, explore it more in detail with any one of you. If you're interested in setting up systems, please do let me know, and um, and I'd be I'd be interested to explore it further. And we have a few other options as well uh, and bundle mm -hmm. options and so on. Um, yeah, so that requires a bit more detail discussion exactly so lucas can actually give you very nice estimations he just needs to know a bit more of the framework conditions in your country and then they can give you nice estimations we did that for tunisia already and it was very quick so don't hesitate to come back to lucas and then there was anna again she asked um could you explain still how you register the farmers that are used in the survey so how do you yeah you know, do the registration process sure um so uh, if they receive a voice-based survey um, or if they call into any of our hotlines that we've set up with our partners, uh, they are basically asked to, to register. Uh, we could make that mandatory so that they can't continue without registering. And this registration could basically include about anything that you want to ask them. We usually at least ask them for their age, their gender and their localization with a, let's say, a vocal drop-down menu. So we can't have the GPS points, um, but it is it is indeed targeted. We can do the targeting because based on that information, we have the gender, we have the age, we have the localization. We uh, in the system we have the preferences. So basically, based on legacy data, um, on the access data, the messages that they are listening, we can then do the targeting and say, okay, we're interested in women between 35 and 50 years. In, uh, in a given area um, that are interested in soya beans. Uh, we can pull them out of the system and uh, use them for surveys. We actually, through our IVR systems and people that do register, we have to ask them if they would be um, uh, okay to be contacted for surveys. And we have in different countries, different databases uh, that, that always uh, that can basically Furnish you with um, telephone numbers, or furnish us with telephone numbers for surveys that you that you want to do. Let's say for targeting. Um, in Madagascar, for example, we have about 130,000 people that are registered in our database that are okay to um, to participate in a survey, and we use that database a lot to run surveys. For example, for the World Bank or for UCID, if they are about to set up a new program but they need a bit of field information, we've just run a survey with about 3,000 respondents um, for a solar market study for the World Bank. We just pull that information out of our database and it's statistically significant on the national level. And they were particularly interested in rural women households. Okay, thank you. That also um, comes a bit to the gender question, but as we really have to finish now, I just want to uh, go to one more question that is from Antje. Um, if you use, so she clarifies the um, land planning question. She says, do you have any experiences using your uh, three different technologies to support the participatory planning processes in the field of land planning? Um, or we could also think about um, the risk management planning in the case of droughts or yeah, extreme weather. Um, yeah. Do you have um, any experiences with that? We, gen we generally have experience in participatory, uh, participatory uh, projects uh, and, and processes where we can basically take uh, take the information from people, ask them about a few things, uh, also in, in, in two-step approaches. First, qualitative information. What are your biggest worries about land planning or about this new mine that is setting up next to you? And then in a second uh, wave, ask them, okay, what is your biggest worry out of these following five that we have identified previously. Okay, um, thanks. And I'd be happy, Antje, to explore that more in detail with you. Just drop me just drop me a line. More or less three last sentences. One is, uh, again, a plaidoyer. Think about mobile for development and ICT for agriculture as a strategic approach. And the earlier you take that into consideration in your project, the better. The best practice that we have at the moment is with a new GIZ program, Adaptation to Climate Change in Madagascar, that have just started and we are helping them to come up with a ICT for agriculture strategy that is all on cap, uh, basically including everything. If you if you take an ICT for D at a later stage, you still have a big impact, but it's significantly lower than in the beginning. And my last sentence is, try it yourself. Just call our our international number that we've set up to link it up with our 3 to 1 mass information in Uganda, where you have access to a lot of different 
IVR messages on different topics, including gamification, including join, uh, playing games and so on, uh, just pop up your Skype account and call the number. And I'd be happy to discuss further with you. Just drop me a line to the email address below. Thank you very much, Lucas. Thank you very much, Paul. Um, it was nice to have you here. Thanks for the input. And yeah, thank you, everybody, for listening. And then see you next time. Goodbye.